Uh, let's welcome in Dr. Gibson. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> Good morning. I'm fine. How are you? Excellent. Great to have you with us. You recently announced your retirement. Congratulations to you, I suppose. Those kind of congratulations are in order. What made you uh, come to that decision? Oh, there were a whole host of factors. Uh, one is the the family, as you just recently uh, referenced. You get older, uh, things change. And um, I have a son who I had for a short time before he goes off to college and uh, spend a little more time with him, I have aging parents, uh, some of the same things that we all face at a certain time in our lives. And um, superintendency is a very all-consuming job. So, um, you know, I think it's I think if you care about all of those aspects of your life, you have to make a decision about whether or not um, you can give what's necessary to all of them. And when you decide that you can't, you, you need to you need to step away. You were the and are because you won't be retiring till the end of the school year uh, for mm-hmm. seven years, Bondi. Eight. Eight. Eight years. I remember interviewing you when you were relatively new to the position after you had gotten hired. As you look back on your term, do you feel like you've accomplished what you wanted to accomplish? Oh, no. I, I, um, you know, you're always ambitious about all of the the things that you want to do for kids. And there's always you always think that you can do more. Um, But I think given the obstacles that uh, we face, we weathered them well. I think uh, Jefferson is in a pretty good position moving forward. As you enter this final phase of your professional career, do you also continue to pay attention to what's going on in Charleston, where the Education Committee has been active in proposing different bills for this session? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I've uh, given seven, several presentations to the staff and, you know, w- reviewed the bills with them and been very encouraging for them to speak to their legislators. They need to hear from the people who have to um, enact these things, who have to live with the consequences of them. And so they need to be informed. We keep on our website a legislative page where folks can go there and see who their representatives are and track the bills and let their voices be heard. The Capitol is considering reading proficiency bills, uh, STEM bills, teacher raise uh, in pay bills. Are there any that you're specifically tracking and uh, have offered input to any members of your local mm-hmm. delegation? Um, in terms of offering uh, input, what, when you say tracking, track all of them. Uh, mm-hmm. They are all going to have some effect on you in one way or another, um, sometimes in unforeseen ways. Uh, certainly compensation for our staff is always a top priority uh, in this area in an attempt to be competitive and deal with staffing shortages. Uh, I think that there are, uh, in terms of the bills for both staffing and for um, curriculum, for discipline, there are some uh, interesting bills out there that I think, as always, have positive intent, but sometimes aren't well thought through in terms of what the, the practical consequences of that would be on the ground. Let's uh, Speaking of that, I think that's a great way to transition into a reading proficiency bill because this is starting to SB 274. And it's also called the Third Grade Success Act. And, and many of these bills are fairly similar in the sense that the, the theme this year seems to be holding students accountable. So if you're not proficient at making uh, the academic achievements of that grade, not passing the student forward for the sake of promoting the student to the next grade. What, what are the disadvantages of that, Dr. Gibson? What are the, what are the advantages of that? Well, um, actually, that that methodology has been used in other uh, states, um, most uh, recently in Florida. And after a few years, they ceased uh, that practice because there were some very practical implications in terms of, okay, if uh, the student's not proficient and you then hold that student back, 
simply putting them through the program for another year is ineffective. You know, uh, that's the you know very definition of madness, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So you have to have programmatically um, interventions and supports in place that are more intensive, that have lower staff-to-student ratios, that have uh, highly specialized programs that teachers need training in. If you're looking at Orton-Gillingham methodologies, you're looking at Wilson Reading, you're looking at there are programs out there that will support students who really are struggling um, to read, but those programs require a lot of staff training. They require uh, um, an inordinate amount of intensive time on those subjects. And if you're going to require that, again, you have to put the resources behind it. Simply putting that hard stop and saying, fix this without then giving school systems the resources to do that um, it is nothing more than frustration and, quite frankly, lead to an increase in the dropout rate when these kids aren't successful over time. Have you communicated that to your local elected delegates? Um, we have not yet had our um, annually when the school board goes to the um, winter conference in February, they meet with our local legislators and share information. So we haven't had that meeting yet, but I feel quite certain that uh, our staff and our administration will communicate with our legislators about a whole host of bills and and sometimes not even for or against, quite frankly, just if this is if this is what you're hearing from your constituents and, and I understand the urgency around reading. They are entirely correct about that. I don't disagree uh, that we should m- make very sure kids have that foundation in third grade. What needs to happen, though, is that there needs to be a clear, uh, identified, resourced plan for the consequences of that decision. That's what needs to be in place. Joe. Dr. Gibson, Joe Ferretti, it's uh, great to talk with you this morning. Uh, The teachers unions had a listening tour that they conducted last fall where they went around the various communities in West Virginia and talked to the constituents, the citizens, and got input as to what they thought was important for our schools going forward. One of the main issues they brought up was, uh, and the unions cited this in their uh, production of the information they obtained in these listening tours, was parental involvement and and basically the lack thereof. Uh, As a consumer of of, uh, both public and private schools in this area, when my children went through the school systems, uh, I did see a difference between public and private schools and, and the level of parental involvement. Now, I'm not smart enough to know why that is, but I do recognize the importance of it in terms of the uh, the productivities in the school and and, and certainly the, the, the performance of both the school and the student. What's your experience involving parental involvement in, in your school district, and how can we improve on that? Mm. First of all, I would validate every uh, sentiment you just conveyed. I myself have seen the difference, and I... Again, when there's uh, a whole host of uh, reasons behind that, I do think that the last several years, um, in particular with uh, COVID, uh, really changed the dynamic in public schools between parents and school systems. And as those restrictions were removed, um, it hasn't fully returned in terms of uh, parents feeling like uh, public schools are always a, a welcoming environment. We have opened our doors back up. We have invited uh, folks in. Uh, I will say there's also, in in today's environment, there is a bit of trepidation, I think, on, on all sides. There have been, uh, as you well know, an increase in incidents of really just incivility and aggression. And um, it can sometimes feel like a, a threatening relationship. And I don't think that is what educators or uh, parents want. And I think that we're, we've been exploring different venues for that. Uh, this year, 
we started uh, several parent advisory committee uh, meetings where we brought parents in and we said, what could we do to help you feel more welcome? You know, how much more social media can we get out to you? How many more venues can we have uh, for you to have input? We understand that you're busy, that you're working hard, that it's been a tiring uh, several years and, and you're uh, uh, probably a little burnt out. What can we do that would help you feel welcome and that that's within your bandwidth? You know, and uh, so we've expanded uh, several of our communication tools back and forth with parents. Uh, we've had several events where uh, we've brought folks in in the evening. We've had um, more interactive uh, events with parents where we say, hey, come in, have a nice spaghetti dinner. Here's some books. Read with your kids. Take the books home and enjoy your time with them. And it's it's slowly coming back, but um, it, it's definitely not at pre-COVID levels yet. Yeah, I agree. The incivility is a concern. Uh, and I, I, my theory is that that's born of, of a lack of information uh, rather than uh, something legitimate to scream about. And, and, I, and one way I would submit to parents is to come to school and learn what's going on before you accept somebody else's uh, representation on, on social media. Uh, don't come to school with pitchforks. Come with an a, an inqu- inquiring mind about what what is happening with your student, I think you'll go a long way towards solving that that problem. The legislature is also dealing with issues uh, uh, that were raised in these uh, listening tours regarding school discipline, and uh, the legislature is making an effort to address that by statute. Do you think that's a good approach? And do you think that's something that uh, we really need to focus on in terms of how to handle students who are disruptive or a discipline problem? Uh, well, first, absolutely. If um, when there have been several uh, surveys of uh, teachers um, regarding the shortage and uh, student discipline uh, has on several of the polls topped even uh, pay as a reason yes. for teachers to leave the profession. They're they're exhausted. And we have students who, having missed, you know, oftentimes nearly two years worth of uh, socialization, um, who are really exhibiting some, um, oh, just very difficult to manage behaviors. And very, even the ones that aren't um, uh, physically aggressive are are very delayed in terms of their social emotional maturity. So you have students who are in, you know, say a teenage body, but they are reacting to um, to things in their environment like an 11 year old, and that is problematic. So our teachers are certainly struggling with how to manage those without resorting to an enormous amount of removal. Because every time you remove the kid from the educational environment, we put ourselves one more step back and actually having them catch up. So it's a, you know, it's a catch 22, but at the same time, we have to ensure a safe learning environment. So we've actually had a committee that's been working on this this year with uh, parents, service personnel, uh, we went around to every middle and high school and interviewed uh, classes full of students about what they felt like would work for them. And they're remarkably um, intuitive. And a, a good number of them um, uh, identified very clearly that they need um, more social emotional coping skills, that they're not learning them at home. Um, not all of them, and that the ones that aren't, we need to explicitly teach that, that our, you know, suspension system, they don't believe is effective. Uh, Kids go out, they come back in, they're the same kids. It just happens again, and that can be frustrating. We need a a vast expansion of our mental health services. We need um, alternative responsive education programs. We have a a fantastic responsive educational program in our Opportunity Learning Center. Kids get individual therapy. They get group therapy. They do community service. Um, 
and we've had a wonderful uh, experience with them. Um, very low recidivism rate. However, that's a very small program. We have less than 20 kids in that program. I could run 100 kids through there, and, and they'd benefit. But being able to expand that is a matter of space and staff and resources. You know, as always, we can do anything. We just can't do everything. And you have to decide where you're going to put your attention and resources. John Bodwell. Dr. Gibson, um, I know you guys are, are closer to Loudoun County, Frederick County than we are. Um, what do you feel are the, the biggest obstacles to teacher retention? I mean, I know we've talked a little about discipline, but as always, the, the, big, the big elephant in the room, of course, is teacher pay and teacher, teacher retention. I mean, it, the more the, the difficulties in the classroom and the more the, the, it's tougher to, you know, like you said, you could put 100 kids in a program like that, you have 20. Um, does that, coupled with teacher pay, I mean, what, what is the greatest obstacle to, to retaining teachers? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, I, again, I don't think that there's any one obstacle in terms of retention. I think the things that are the most um, difficult right now are, number one, just the, the shortage itself. Uh, teachers, in addition to handling their own caseload, we are managing um, um unfilled positions and of the positions that are filled, we have a higher and higher percentage every year of long-term substitutes, people who they have a college degree. They certainly um, know their content. They have the intellectual capacity to teach, obviously, but they were not trained as teachers. So they need an enormous amount of support in terms of their methodologies, classroom management, their pedagogy. And oftentimes, you know, we're collectively sort of trying to hold them up and cover classes with subs and just the exhaustion of that um, and, and the sort of the public pressure to get these kids, you know, back up, uh, I think is the thing that's wearing on teachers the most. They're just they're exhausted and you can carry an extra load through a crisis. You know, we got through COVID and it was, it was sort of like this, let's all band together. We know this is crazy times. We can do this. Let's completely overhaul the system. I know this is hard, but we'll get through it. Well, now we're on the other side and um, we see for years um, teacher shortages there just there aren't people in the pipeline, um, and um, as you spoke about earlier, some of this public um, um, discourse around public schools is discouraging people from coming into the profession, and so th there really just isn't an end in sight in terms of getting more people into the profession, and that just can feel deflating to teachers. So some of it is just a morale issue. Um, in terms of pay, we instituted this year a micro-credential program, uh, so every staff person, um, both professional and service, could earn an extra $3,000 this year. Um, our, our starting pay is higher than Frederick, Maryland, in, in Jefferson, if you do that micro-credential program. And it's still, again, it, it's, it's not enough. But uh, I honestly believe that more so than pay, just the, the morale, the, the support for teachers needs to be there. I think your, your point's a good one, John, and, and uh, Dr. Gibson Learn, our guest here on the program. Uh, when you look at what the starting pay is for teacher pay in West Virginia, that's discouraging if you just spent umpteen thousand dollars going to college to get a teaching degree. But the top end also tops out too low compared to the surrounding areas as well here in, uh, in West Virginia. And that also needs to be addressed because the cap on a teacher who's been working 25, 30 years is nowhere near what a teacher who's been working 25 or 30 years across any of the borders around here is too. So there's, there's the starting and then there's the cap that ends up topping it out too soon for teachers who've been around a while. And that discourages teachers from continuing to teach when these are your most experienced teachers. You lose a lot Absolutely. of inst institutional Absolutely. knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
And I, yes, I've, sir. And, and that's what helps support the next generation of teachers. You lose those teachers. And, and we do have an aging teaching population because of that. And um, you, you lose so much in terms of pedagogy and experience in working with kids. Pedagogy is such a great word. You need, a, you need a superintendent to throw yes, that one out because yes. we don't get that usually from no. other guests. I tell you, I mean, it's just we're sort of like the Baltimore Orioles of school systems, and I've said this before. We, we get the young teachers, we train them, they become great teachers, and then they leave for greener pastures. And uh, at some point, West Virginia is going to have to see that and it's going to have to figure out a way to keep the Well, teachers. the delegation is addressing teacher pay with more aggressive raises being proposed while we have these billion-dollar surpluses going on. We'll see where, they, where that goes. Dr. Uh, Bondi Shea Gibson learn our guest here on the program. I want to thank you very much. The last word is yours, Doctor. Oh, just thank you so much for being um, thoughtful proponents of public education. Um, I think that we probably have a lot more in common as a society about what we want for our kids than we have differences. And I, I hope we're coming to a point where we can focus on those and move forward together. So and, thank you so much for being a part of that. And make sure before your last day, Hans Fogel springs for lunch at least once. <laughs> Will do. I'll let him know. He's probably listening. <laughs> thank you, doctor. Thank, thank you. you, doctor. Have a great day. You too.